Hello, I'm Will Sampson. Welcome to the Woodworking Network Podcast. Welcome to this episode of the Woodworking Network Podcast. Join us as we explore the business of woodworking, big and small, and what it takes to succeed. I'm Will Sampson. This episode is sponsored by FDMC Magazine, and don't forget to take our survey at woodworkingnetwork.com slash podcast dash survey. Today we'll be continuing our conversation with Martin Goebel, talking about how to succeed as a young woodworking entrepreneur. But first, I want to talk about profit is not a four-letter word. For craftspeople of all types, but especially woodworkers starting out, there seems to be an irrational guilt associated with being or even becoming successful. For some, it seems that discussing profits or becoming profitable is akin to unleashing an F-bomb in church. But profit is not a four-letter word. In fact, profit is the lifeblood of any business. So why all the guilt about talking about it, about learning how to be profitable? about being financially successful. I think it might just go back to how most woodworkers come to this business. There is a long history of people discovering how much they enjoy woodworking and then trying to turn a hobby into their life's work. But they often are so focused on the craft that they overlook the business side, or they just don't know where to begin about learning business skills. Many woodworking schools compound this problem by totally emphasizing woodworking skills and often ignoring business and employment skills that are absolutely necessary to make woodworking a successful career. It's really funny how some programs will devote dozens of classes to teaching a myriad of hand tool and machine woodworking skills, but bypass anything resembling basic accounting, marketing, sales, and management skills. I can't count how many times I've been told by experienced professional woodworkers how they picked up their business skills on the job and never were taught those skills in school. No wonder so many small shops struggle. And when I talk to schools that claim to be training woodworkers for careers, I'm often met by silence when I ask what business classes are included in their program. I know many cases of business people who bought woodworking businesses without really knowing anything about woodworking, and they propelled those businesses to new heights. You could be an excellent craftsperson, but if you fail to properly market and price your work, if you fail to manage the business side of your operation properly, you are destined for failure, or at least not achieving real financial success. Maybe you say that kind of success doesn't matter to you. All you want to do is make the best quality products you can. But wouldn't you rather make those products for people who really appreciate them and pay you what they are worth? Wouldn't you rather spend more time with your family rather than putting in such long hours only to come up short when it comes to paying bills and getting ahead? Wouldn't you like to be able to afford better equipment and materials? What about hiring more help or expanding to a better location? It's all a part of making a profit, and it's never too late to learn how. Online and community college courses are available to teach business skills. Ask a successful business person in your circle of friends to mentor you. Contact SCORE online at score.org. To connect with a retired business executive for free advice. Join a trade association like the Cabinet Makers Association online at cabinetmakers.org. Learn what you need to know. Then you can start treating business skills as just more tools in your kit, and you don't have to be shocked or uncomfortable when someone starts talking about profit. Before we get back to Martin Goebel, let's pause for a word from our sponsor. 
FDMC Magazine is your vital source of information to improve your woodworking business. Whether it's keeping you apprised of the latest advances in manufacturing, helping you solve your wood technology problems with Gene Wengert, or inspiring you with case histories about successful businesses and best practices, FDMC Magazine is there to be the sharpest business tool in your shop. Learn more and subscribe for free at woodworkingnetwork.com slash FDMC. Now let's resume our chat with Martin Goble of Goble Furniture. Now, I want to talk a little bit more. You were you were getting into the new technologies and things like that. What, where do you see the industry going? What What's the, the shop of tomorrow going to look like? Well, I think that... Um... You know, a lot of the, the lean manufacturing thought process is going to be um, brought into smaller shops. And the access to technology, just like any technology, has gone down in price. And then ex and the accessibility has exploded in the last couple of years. Uh, I really, really hope that government does any number of things with regard to subsidizing then uh, domestic manufacturing and then most importantly getting some of this technology based uh, equipment into shops so it's one thing to talk about it in aerospace it's one thing to talk about it in medical manufacturing and that's where it all started you know the 70s and 80s had the uh, large scale cnc uh, milling with regard to titanium regard to steel, any number of these harder to work with projects, or sorry, uh, products. But in the case of wood, it's a very malleable product. So it, the technology and the expense to, of the technology has been slow to come into our industry. So unless there's gonna be some sort of government subsidizing of our industry, it's gonna be a really rough go with regard to Younger people bring that technology and know-how into our industry, but it's really going to be the lifeblood of the industry. It's already happening in China, obviously. It's happening um, in any number of places in Europe. But um, one day, I guess, uh, I would hope to see the, the industry would then give better access to the higher technology uh, to smaller shops, because now that's when you're going to get a lot more accessibility to better quality product. When you mentioned, uh, you know, 3D printing, do you think that there's going to be that additive uh, manufacturing techniques like that are, are going to come to wood? Well, I don't think they're going to come to wood. They might be coming with some sort of a wood pulp. Obviously, you can't 3D print a tree and have a, a tree, <laughs> you know, any, right. uh, any su a substance. Um, but I think that you know, with that, we use a lot of the 3D printing with regard to sales tools to let people understand what it is that we're going to now be able to produce. Because in the case of custom, um, you and I might be able to envision what something's going to look like, but, you know, other people don't have that skill set, nor should they, unless they've been in this industry or been in the design industry. So, you know, again, it, it all comes back to sales and then making people comfortable with buying through someone who's not Ikea. You know, in the case that now all of a sudden you see something in a big store out in the middle of, you know, strip mall hell, and um, you can say, well, I'm going to buy that one, and I'm going to walk to the end of the, the aisle here and pick up the box, and it'll be that exact one. It's rather, it's how sales and how buying uh, psyche works. But in the case of now 3D printing, if I say, hey, I just drew this really fabulous thing in my computer, it's in this awful grayscale, rotated, not very interesting, no wood grain, no color, no nothing. It's hard for people to grasp. So, you know, I don't know if there will actually be an additive manufacturing, but the, the really interesting thing about the, like uh, Thermwood Routers is doing this these days. They're one of the biggest additive manufacturing uh, companies in the U.S., but they not only do the additive manufacturing, but then they do re uh, the reductive manufacturing with regard to the 3D print something, uh, which is, let's say, 110% of the cubic inches of what the part is, and then they will five-axis mill the outside of it to reduce it down to the true component. They do a lot of that with regard to carbon fiber reinforced plastics, uh, products for aerospace, any number of those things. And I think that you'll slowly see that incorporated, but you know, in the case of 
wood manufacturing, I think that's skipping a few steps. You know, let, let's get the, the, the right tools and the toolbox into the hands of craftsmen. So even as simple as a three axis CNC, it's now going to buzz out parts. So you're not using shapers, you know. Right, right. No, I, I think it's interesting, too, that, that you use craftsmanship as a term, you know, along with all of this technology, you know, that you're not seeing a conflict between craftsmanship and technology. And I think that some of the resistance that we get to technology is old lying woodworkers who do see that the technology is somehow hurting craftsmanship. Oh, you know, I think that there's some contingent uh, of any industry that's going to be afraid of technology and progress. But if you went to a shipwright of the 1600s and you said, hey, you know, use a method from 50 years ago or 100 years ago, they look at you like you're insane, just as I do now. And, um, you know, I, I would assume the same conversation happened when electric motors came into the woodworking industry. You know, you're not doing it based on line shafts. Well, why would I do that? Why would I, you know, I don't know. I, I find that to be a moot point. Um, I think and that Sister a lot of Tabitha of the Shakers in, envisioned the circular saw. The guys that were in the pit saw, I'm sure, applauded her. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I just think that uh, there's so much, of, and this is a, something that people kind of, press back on me quite a bit with, I think that craftsmanship is so much about the vanity of the craftsman and it fails when it comes to really what we're out here to do, which is make money and sell things to individuals who are going to buy them. And that gets back to the business side of it as opposed to the weekend warrior craftsman side of it. You know, in the case that now all of a sudden I can produce the exact same, if not a better quality product, simply by using craftsmen that, or sorry, uh, uh, automated uh, tools as opposed to craftsmen um, keeps more people safe, reduces costs, any number of these things. Hey, you'd be you'd be crazy not to do that. And, and you know, if I can now put out a dining table for two thousand dollars that someone else would put out for four thousand dollars, is someone going to pay double the price simply because now there was a craftsman that one hundred percent made every part of it? Uh, you know, I don't know, you know, where are you going to draw the line there? Well, there's a, a table saw that did it as opposed to, again, a guy with the, the hand saw. You know, I don't know. I find that to be almost a, a comical response. And it's one where, again, if, if I'm going to get my sundial out and tell time, sure, I'll get my hand saw out and, and do that as well. But I prefer my Timex and my my aromatic table saw, you know. Do you think that that woodworkers entering the industry now should have more, uh, particularly ones who, who think they want to run their own businesses, should have more formal business training? I mean, that seems to be lacking in a lot of the the school programs. Uh, I, I had this discussion with Jim Krenoff. You were at at uh, College of the Redwoods at the Krenoff School, and and he wasn't really into the business side of things, but. Uh, no. uh, what do you think? So uh, it's a tough one. I think that early on in school, you shouldn't, I, I'm really not a fan of diverse education. I think that you need to become as good as you can be at any one task. And then you need to supplement that information or that skill set with other people that are just as good in the business realm or just as good in the craftsman realm or just as good in the finishing realm or the marketing realm. Because if you really want to make a successful go of it, it's bigger than any one person. I was an individual craftsman in a shop for nine years before I ever ventured off into larger uh, production. You know, I worked 12 hour days. Uh, I was, you know, you see the, the dirt from the day come off in the shower and in your nose and all of that. And to live a comfortable life, for me, it was always going to be a bigger endeavor because I enjoyed some of the creature comforts of life. I enjoyed not being forced to work on a Saturday. So business training, I think, is always helpful. I think it's always, you know, better to have more knowledge and less knowledge. But it's sort of like a little knowledge can be a dangerous thing. You know, in the case of going out there and being the best 
craftsman you can possibly be, find someone to run the business aspect of it because the business person is going to be a terrible craftsman and you're probably not going to be the greatest business person as opposed to someone who's studied that their entire career or their entire educational career. So that's kind of the way that we've set up our company these days. Um, Start, I definitely did a lot of the different things, as I mentioned, but it was always going to be, you know, a time in which was going to be, you know, finite. We weren't ever going to now have me do it all because there's not enough hours in the day and there's not enough training that I had in, in all aspects of it. So I coordinate a lot about that these days, but we've got a fabulous production manager, Jason Dacus, um, who now runs our production shop and a few other just really key craftsmen. We've got graphic designer, we've got a office manager, sort of bookkeeper controller type that now runs the, uh, the finances and things like that. We have lawyers, we have accountants, and those are standard business operations. Um, I'm trying to talk development, design, all of those things. If I'm ever the true CEO of my company, when there's 50 of us and in production and another God knows how many, I, I'm, I wouldn't hire myself for that job. So I'm not going to half-ass train myself for that job. That makes sense. What What is your advice to young woodworkers starting out today? What What do you tell them? What's the, the key thing? You know, very much to the point of uh, what I was saying earlier, it's become the best craftsman you possibly can be. You know, spend as many hours, you know, covered in dust as you possibly can until you can't stand it anymore because you're going to get an intuitive knowledge of what works, what doesn't work, what and what you want. And what you want, I think, is a really big thing within our industry because, you know, within wood manufacturing or craftsmanship or, you know, one-of-a-kind furniture, there's so much work out there. I, I can't even, I always have to chuckle a little bit when, when people get high and mighty with each other on Instagram of who's doing what better. It doesn't matter. It, do what you do best, you know, play your own game. I assure you there's going to be someone out there to buy it, you know, and uh, it's when people are underskilled and they try to talk their way into having a, a great product. I think that's really where I bristle at it. So with young craftsmen, um, you know, don't worry about what other people are doing. Just worry about being the best at what you're doing. And in the case of craftsmanship, you know, they always talk about like 20,000 hours as a mastery of any skill set. I think within the furniture or the woodworking realm, it's significantly beyond that. I think that's a proficiency standpoint, 20,000 hours would be. So at a 2,000 hour year, that's 10,000 or that's 10 years. You know, 2,000 hours being a work, uh, the number of hours you'd work in a year. But, you know, if you can push more hours and you're a young guy and you like, you know, just being, you know, elbows deep in it, do the work cheaper, you know, sell the table for a thousand bucks because you know what you have a lot of is furniture and wood. (laughs) (laughs) There's always going to be another piece of furniture. Just get out there and make as much as you possibly can. That's it for today. If you're looking for more of our podcasts, you can find all of them at woodworkingnetwork.com slash podcasts and in popular podcast channels. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Thanks again to today's sponsor, FDMC Magazine. If you have a comment or topic you'd like us to explore, contact me at will.sampson at woodworkingnetwork.com. Thanks for listening.